Hallelujah to the glory of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the glory of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the glory of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our God. with us. We're really excited for all of you guys to be here to worship God together. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm just going to just bring you up to speed on just a few announcements this morning. Um, first of all, if you want to service, make sure you go to riverparkkc.com backslash today. And what you will see in there is uh, you'll have, you'll be able to see the song lyrics of the songs that we're going to be singing this morning. You'll be able to see the scripture readings that we're going to be going over. And most importantly, there's also a connection card uh, in there as well. So make sure you fill out the connection card. That's our primary way to communicate with you, uh, to make sure that you're up to speed on all the events and things that are happening with River Park. Um, secondly, just a couple of expectations of what our worship service looks like is uh, we are obviously outside in the park. And so sometimes the train will go by, and uh, if that happens during our worship service, we'll just pause for a couple seconds, let the train go by, so don't be alarmed by that. Um, also, we are a family worship service, so what that means, as you can see, we have kids that are going to be joining us this morning and staying throughout the whole, wor whole worship service, so uh, we're going to have some wiggles, and especially since it's cold, maybe some noises, so don't uh, be a, it's okay if you want to bring your kids in the back if they get a little noisy as well. Speaking of kids, we've had some kids that uh, here at River Park KC that have been uh, working on a verse throughout the week. And so I'm going to invite Hannah up here to uh, practice that. Here's hoping my coffee doesn't blow away in the wind. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do the motions with the verse. We've been working on our verse together. But first, let's warm up our arms a little bit, okay? So raise up your arms really high. Okay, put your arms down. Arms out to the side. Put them in. Put them out. Up, down, out, in, out. Okay, are your arms warmed up and ready? Okay. <laughs> as warm as they're going to be right now. <laughs> All right, so we'll go through it really slowly the first time, and then we'll go straight through it the next time, okay? So I'll say part of it, and then you guys repeat after me with the motions, okay? Everyone say, Jeremiah 32, 17. O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. All right, you think you got it? Okay, let's all do it together as loud as you can, all right? Jeremiah 32, 17. O oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Woo, great job, everybody. There will be a, uh, a verse every single week that we will send through email uh, for the kids to work on. So make sure that you fill out that connection card to make sure that you have an email address that we can send that to you um, as well. Um, and last announcement is this is our last service here uh, for the year in English Landing Park. So next week and the following weeks, we're actually going to be at Legion Hall, which is uh, downtown Parkville, right next to Stone Canyon. 
Um, so if there's anyone that's out there that wants to help out with uh, setup and teardown, or if you have any music uh, kind of abilities, make sure you either ask Josh or uh, come up to Stephen after the service. We would love for you guys to help out to help us set up and tear down as well. All right, we're going to go into our call to worship. And our call to worship is a time where we read a portion of scripture. And we do this every single week at River Park, and it's very intentional. Um, the reason that we do it is to help prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God and continue to worship him. So I don't know if your morning has been like my family's morning, but sometimes Sunday mornings are just downright stressful. <laughs> and so I don't know what your Sunday morning has been like. I don't know what your week has been like. But as I read these verses, really think about them and allow your mind and your heart to be prepared for worship as we continue to worship together. This is a reading from Psalm 95, 1 through 7. Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Let's continue to worship together. next song is a revelation song.
thank you, Lord, for uh, this beautiful morning. Um, even though it's brisk, I appreciate the opportunity that we have to come out and worship with each other freely um, and not be afraid of persecution or anything uh, negative like our brothers and sisters around the world. I pray that you would strengthen them. And I pray that you would give us attentive uh, ears and open hearts to the message that Daniel or Stephen's going <laughs> to share with us. Um, and I pray that we would just uh, apply it this week as we go on in our lives. Um, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Alex, awesome guys. I don't know how you sang without your voice shaking at all. I was shaking all over the place. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and to have you all with us here. Uh, this like Matt said, is our, our final River Park at the Park of 2020. And, um, you know, so far we've been working through the book of Colossians over the last several weeks. And um, we're just going to continue going this morning. And, um, if, by the way, I don't know that I mentioned my name. I'm Stephen Daniel, so I ha kind of have two first names. So it's okay if I get called Daniel. I respond to both. Um, if I've never met you, I'd love to meet you after the service. Um, so we've, we're at Colossians 3 this week, and um, so far there's this, been this theme that's cropped up in Colossians, and it's, the theme here is that God's actually establishing a new kind of community. And uh, the, the letter of Colossians I find to be particularly applicable to us. River Park Church is a new church, and the letter of Colossians was written to a relatively new church. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that we can learn from it. Um, this new community that God's establishing uh, in his church is to be one of a, a different kind, a different culture, a different way of doing things. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what that is today. And uh, the last thing we read last week, it was from chapter 3, verse 11. I'm going to step back a little bit. My voice is getting a little choppy. Uh, verse 11 told us that, hey, you have a new identity. For those who choose to, to follow Christ, for those that uh, make him the boss of their life, you actually have a new thing about you that is the most important thing about you. In, in verse 11, it talks about in Christ, there's no longer a Jew and Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, all these different ways of categorizing people. And, you know, we do that today in our own contexts. We have uh, the various economic class, we have race and all different ways of, of categorizing and ranking each other. And, and he's just saying, look, in Christ, there's, there's none of that. Jesus now is the most important thing about you. And this actually is the basis of a new identity. And we're going to continue that conversation today. You know, Paul uses the imagery of clothes, of taking off an old set of clothes and putting on a new set of clothes. And, and as God's people, uh, we are to, to make that clothes change. And, and these clothes actually represent a way of life, ways of doing things, God's way versus the world's way. We find in Scripture that God's way is often upside down to the world's ways of doing things. And, uh, you know, God knew that would be a, a challenge for us, so he gave us a model to follow. Uh, when he sent Jesus, he actually showed us what's it look like to do life God's way in this world. And so we're going to check out his example and see how we are to do that. Um, so today we're going to look at verses 12 through 14 in chapter 3 of Colossians. And Paul describes those clothes in these verses. And he also gives us uh, sort of a, a basis for keeping those on and choosing each day to live according to God's way. I'm going to read chapter 3, 12 through 14 here. And if you haven't gone there yet, you can actually read the verses along with me at riverparkkc.com slash today. Um, it's written around here every once in a while. Um, so I'll have the, the points are listed there as well as the scripture that I'm reading from. Um, you can also go to your favorite Bible app. Uh, and if you don't have a, 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 a paper Bible, we have some for free back there by the coffee. You can take one home with you. Um, so chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. 
Just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also are to forgive. And above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I'm going to pray and ask for the Lord's help here, and then we're going to break this apart a little bit and look at what it has to do with with us today. Father, thank you um, again for your word and for sending Jesus to be a living example of what it's like to walk through life in your ways. Father, please um, help us, Lord, to feel warm in spite of the wind and uh, to be able to hear from you. Please, Lord, uh, help me to say only what's helpful. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. When a Bible verse begins in therefore, you want to know what it's there for. And this one, uh, it begins with therefore. So in a a very short sense, he's saying, hey, since such and such happened, this ought to be the result. Since God did something, this is how we respond. And very specifically, he's saying, since you've been given this new identity, begin to adopt Christ's ways. But we learn something here about the nature of our new identity. We learn that our new identity in Christ comes from God's demonstrated grace. It says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on. So I want to look at what those words really mean. You see, there's many ways to take on a new identity. Uh, You can buy it. You know, you can, you can become a member of a golf club or of an organization by buying your way in. You can join a new company, get a new career, and you sort of take on a new identity as I'm a carpenter, I'm a whatever you may choose. And so there's different ways of taking on identity. And this new identity, I'm going to start shaking, it's getting cold. Uh, this new identity is one that's a little bit closer to marriage. Than any other uh, analogy I can think of, it, it, because it's it's based and founded in love. You see, we, when God God chose us, He calls us holy, and it says dearly loved. Now I'll explain the marriage thing a little bit more here, but let's first look at the word chosen. When when He calls us God's chosen ones, He's actually referencing back to an Old Testament book. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, where God had just carved out his people, his Israelites, from the Egyptians. He had pulled them out of slavery and rescued them. And God says, hey, you are my chosen people. But he tells them, it's not because how awesome you are. Like, it's not because you're this huge, powerful group of people that I want to put my stamp on. God just says, I chose you. Because of who I am, because I love you, I chose you. So when when Paul tells us that, hey, therefore, as God's chosen ones, to us, it means the same. It's not because we're so awesome. We're the the coolest kids in town. It's because God just chose us out of his grace and kindness. He chose us. Holy. Think set apart. That's what the word holy means. Set apart for something special. Um, When we trust Christ as our Savior and Lord, he sets us apart for himself. When you're holy, you are wholly his, completely his, for his purposes. And then dearly loved. God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved ones. Again, we're we're not loved because of how awesome we are. You know, at the basis of our new identity, it's, it's founded in love. You know, sometimes it's, we can feel unloved. But to those who follow Christ, it, that is never the case. And it's never because of something wrong that you did. If you, if you, you mess up, you do something that you you're regret, you're, you're ashamed of, he still loves us. He knew all of that at the very beginning when he chose us, set us apart, and loved us. And that's the, the foundation of this new identity. Again, it's like marriage, you know, God, when, in marriage... Two people, they, they choose one another. They set themselves apart for the other, and they love each other. And it's not like this falling in love idea that we hear about today that are, f- you know, filled in Disney movies. It's, it's not that. It's not the squishy emotion of love. It's a commitment, a choice that I'm going to put this person's good ahead of my own. Sacrificial love. That's the kind of love God has 
toward us. How crazy would it be for two people to get married and then one of them, the, the, the groom, runs off with the bridesmaid? It would be pretty crazy. And the same would be if we choose, we, we say, hey, I'm going to follow Christ. I am making him, he's going to be the boss of my life, and then turn around and run off with the ways of the world. Because he set us apart for something special, to be holy and love. And we've got to put this at the forefront of our mind. You know, as we begin reading down this list, this list of things that God's saying, hey, put this on, put this on. These are my character traits. I want you to have them. Take them on. The only way we can actually move forward and grow in those areas is to keep this new identity as God's chosen, set apart, and dearly loved people at the forefront of our mind if we're ever going to move forward with this. And that the second point that Paul's making here is in line with our new identity, we put on the ways of Christ. He says, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. These words represent attitudes that Christ demonstrated as he walked the earth. Now, you might have recognized some of those words. They're, they're also called the fruits of the Spirit. You know, when someone uh, puts their trust in Jesus Christ to be the Lord of their life, God's Spirit takes up residence within them and provides the power to begin putting on the character traits of God himself. Let's look at some of these fruits of the Spirit, some of these ways of Jesus. And I want to clarify what they mean for us today in this world. The first one is to put on compassion. Now, this the word compassion is also translated as pity or mercy. And uh, many times, Jesus did some of his amazing work. He fed the 5,000. He healed tons of people. When he taught, he did it many times out of compassion. He would say, this people, they look like a sheep without a shepherd. They're harassed and helpless. I have compassion on them. And then he would begin to teach, or he would begin to heal or feed. He was driven by compassion when he demonstrated love for people. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this is hard for me. Compassion for men particularly can be a very big challenge. For me personally, it's, it's the mission. It's, I, I don't even see the opportunities for compassion because I'm so focused on the task, whether it be to feed myself or to build something or clean something or whatever it may be, prepare a sermon, interruption or, or anything that kind of breaks the flow becomes an obstacle. But what about when it's someone else, a person who has things they are chasing and pursuing and and it, they get hurt. People get hurt. That, that happens. I'm thankful for my wife because she will call these things out to me and say, hey, I think she just needs a hug right now. <laughs> um, rather than, a, well, what did we learn? <laughs> like, well, you won't do that again, will you? You know, that, that's kind of my, my gut response. That is not compassion. It's the opposite. And uh, for you people, I mean, men and women, if you have a hard time with this, I have an exercise for you. Because I think uh, part of the, the, the problem is we don't recognize how much compassion we have already received. So I want to just help you with that. Recognize that when, when God looks at you, he doesn't just see your awesome power and strength and perfection and skills and think, oh, that person, oh, they, they've got it all together. They don't need me. Oftentimes, no, we... we if you're like me, you probably judge yourself pretty harshly. And you, you recognize your own mistakes and your screw-ups. And uh, we kind of think of God looking down at us like we look it down at others. Thinking, ah, I bet you learned that. <laughs> bet you won't do that again. But no, when God, he sees us as his children. When we get our, our hearts broken, we, we experience loss and pain, you turn to God, he's not looking down at you going... He's that dad getting on one knee with open arms. He has and will continue to look at you with passion and pity, mercy. I think 
when we can focus on that and recognize the compassion we have received from our Heavenly Father, we can then turn and offer it to others around us. Do it on the basis of what we've already received from Him. Put on kindness. That's the next one. Kindness is defined as being friendly, generous, considerate. And I found that it's easy to be kind when someone else is being kind to us. Makes it super simple. But to put on kindness as a character trait, to be someone who is just a kind person, it, it, it means even in the other times when people are not necessarily being kind to you. And, and once again, the basis for kindness amongst a group of people who follow Christ is the kindness they have already received from God. Again, we, we need to recognize the, the kindness that we are surrounded with that has come from God. And if you have a hard time um, demonstrating kindness, I want to help you again. Another quick exercise in re- realizing the kindness we've received. Uh, if you have a wife, men, the, the Bible says that's actually, that's a really good thing. He who finds a wife has found a good thing. I hope for the ladies it's, it's also the same for finding your husband. That's actually a kindness from God. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Another thing we learn in Scripture, that's a kindness from God. Did you know the ability to work, the, the ability to actually carry out work, to collect the fruit from our work and to keep it, all of that comes from God himself. Ecclesiastes 2.24 says, There is nothing better for, the, for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I've seen that this is from God's hand. The fact that we can eat and drink and en- enjoy those things is actually a kindness from God. And if you have a hard time, even if any of those things, let's say you don't have any of those things, <laughs> um, as someone who has placed their trust in Jesus Christ, we, we get this deposit called the Holy Spirit, and it is a seal, a token of entry into eternity with God a place that will be full of peace and no more sorrow. And when we recognize that across the the timeline of eternity, this is just a blip, even in the hardest of times right now, we can be filled with joy and recognize that as God's kindness. Put on humility. You know, Jesus was extremely humble. He modeled humility in the greatest way ever by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross and when he did that he was putting god's will and the good of people ahead of his own he laid down his life for us and that's what we do when we put on humility we're laying down our own desires we're actually putting the will of god and the good of others ahead of ourselves we become more interested in protecting the honor of god than our own. At River Park, we want to establish a culture that is honoring to God, and one of our values is to put the goals and interests of others above our own. The wording for this value comes from Philippians 2.4 that says, everyone should look not only to his own interests, but also for the interests of others. To carry out this value requires humility. The next one is put on gentleness. Now, gentleness is is not weakness. It is power under control. My kids and I like to wrestle. Sometimes I get impromptu wrestled with. If If I bend over too far at any place in my house, I could get attacked. And someone comes, you know, flying leap onto my back. It's it's fun. We have a good time. But I could crush them, right, if I really needed to. That's right, Titus. But I don't. Because that would be wrong. And so it's called power under control. You've got to main keep the power under control. You know, we teach our kids when they're handling our kitten, you've got to pet gently, two fingers, you know, just, just be gentle. And we kind of grasp that physically, because if you're physically not gentle too much, you get CPS called on you or you end up in jail, right? You've you got to control yourself. It's with our words, usually, that we... Go cross some boundaries. Um, 
both with our kids and with others, other adults. You know, uh, for, for guys, they like to, we like to sound tough and use strong, harsh, or confident words. You know, so we, we sound tough and self-confident. Um, oftentimes, it's at the expense of coming across as gentle. And once again, we've got to recognize that the heavenly, our Heavenly Father, He's gentle. Because if anybody has access to all power and could accidentally break us, it's him. You know, when I don't know if you ever, I don't go an hour without doing something that, or saying something that I know probably just offended God. And the, the fact that a giant thumb does not come down out of the sky and squash me or flick me across the country, it's his gentleness, his restraint. You know, when Jesus corrected his disciples, oftentimes it was with a question. If anybody could have performed word jujitsu and like laid someone out with their words, it was Jesus, but he didn't. He was gentle on in most occasions. Put on patience. On the word patience, uh, it means long suffering or long tempered. It's the opposite of short tempered. A patient person can put up with a lot. I thought I was a patient person, and then I got a family. And you just, when there's other people close to you that have different opposing wills, you discover if you're a patient person or not. And that's when it comes out. And long-tempered. You know, God demonstrates his patience with us as well. Um, you know, if any time in history people have wondered, like, when is this going to end? Like, God, come back. Wrap this thing up. There's so much evil and, and craziness happening in the world. Why is all this bad stuff still going on? Why don't you just end it? The Bible answers the question. It's, it's because of his patience. There's billions of people on this earth that don't know him, and he wants to. And it's in his patience that he does not wrap things up quite just yet because he wants all people to come to know him. Bearing with one another. You know, after being patient, being told to be patient and to bear with one another, like put up with other people's stuff, you begin to think, like, sh won't this pressure begin to build? Like, if I'm bottling stuff up, eventually it's just going to... That's true. That could happen. But God gives us a release valve. And once again, it's one that he's demonstrated for us. Because the next thing, right after it says, bearing with one another, it says, forgive one another. It says, forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also are to forgive. Based on God's forgiveness, we forgive. He went first, so we can follow. When we forgive another person, we're actually reflecting the image of Christ to other people, because that's like what he did. When you think of the cross, Jesus is getting nailed onto the cross for the sake of our sins, to forgive us so we could come to know God the Father. And the people that are like nailing his hands to the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's forgiveness. There's, if he can do that, and we have his power within us if we're following him, there's nothing we shouldn't be able to forgive. And what I, I mean by forgiveness is not the same thing as, as giving trust. People can damage us in ways that we really should not give them the same trust that we once had. But that's a different matter altogether. Forgiving is to actually no longer hold someone accountable in your mind for what they have done. When God looks at us because of our forgiveness, he sees Jesus on the cross paying for our sins. At River Park, another one of our values is clearing up relationships. We take this one really seriously because if you've ever been around a church for a long time or, or even a company, if you've been around a business for a while, people step on each other's toes and then rather than handling it like an adult and, and clearing it up, they just start walking further from each other in the hallway. You know, you see that person coming, you know, I, 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 they're probably mad at me or I know I'm mad at them, so I don't want to interact with them. I'm just going to go around. That's, that's how it happens, and it happens at home, too. You step on your wife's toe, and you're like, oh, I'm going to give her some days to kind of cool off. 
this clearing up relationships value has been incredibly helpful in our house. Because I'll do something, I, I say something dumb, and I know I've offended her, and say, hey, what I said, that was, that was sin and wrong. Will you please forgive me? And she does. And then we keep moving forward. We have to do the same thing with our kids. It requires humility as well. But again, Jesus went first in all of these things. And the last thing that Paul tells us, the last piece of clothing, the way of God, he tells us to put on is, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Remember, he's writing this letter to a group of people, a church, a relatively new church. And he's saying, between you all, put on love. It'll bond you together in unity. You know, we are called the body of Christ. The church is called the body of Christ. And it, it, if you just imagine a body where the hands will not cooperate with one another, it's going to be kind of hard to pick up anything of significance. You'll probably get some back pains pretty soon. And that's not how it's meant to be. There's meant to be a bond of unity where we can work together, and that is require, it requires love. Also, it's critical to demonstrating God's love to the world around us. Jesus says that the way we'll know people are his disciples is how they love one another. So putting on love is critical if we're going to reflect who God is to the world around us. You know, these things, these character traits of God, they are what make a church community unlike any other organization on the planet. You know, there's, there's great cultures in all kinds of companies and all kinds of neighborhoods, but when a group of people has their identity based on the fact that God has done all of these things for them, they can then respond to each other and the world around them based on that fact. Like, I don't have to respond to someone based on how they just treated me. I can respond to someone based on how God has treated me. That's the only way we can move forward with putting these things on. If, you are per, if you're a Christ follower, um, you've probably wrestled with uh, living out some of these character traits. So I'm going to ask the band to come back up and to, to give us just a, a minute or two of, of a song. And, and while they do that, I just want to give you a moment to think about these. Um, th that list I just worked through is actually also on this page. And just ask God, hey, wh which one of these do you want me to work on? Which one can I, I can move forward in? I'm carrying out and, and trying to demonstrate to my family, to those around me, to my workplace, to my community. Recognize, too. Tell, tell God what he's done for you. Recognize his kindness, his compassion, his gentleness and humility. Recognize that he's put up with your shenanigans and he's forgiven you. And ask him to help you turn that toward other people. If you're not yet sold on following Christ, I'd encourage you to pray for this moment. Um, ask God to reveal himself to you, to show him who he really is, and, and ask him to show you what he sees when he looks at you. Because again, I think you'll, you'll find that father kneeling down on one knee with open arms. I'm going to give you just a, a minute or two while Josh goes. I'm going to come back up and, and pray and you'll be dismissed. first. God, in all of these things, thank you for showing us compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, and humility as you put up with, our, with us sometimes, and you, you've forgiven us. And God, I just thank you that you look at us.
us as your children. Lord, I pray that we would better grasp this new identity that you give us because of your love and the fact that you've chosen us and set us apart. God, please help us as a community of your people to put on these new clothes, to put on your ways and to, to be a reflection of who you are to the world around us and that we would take this blessing that you've given us and turn and give it to those who don't have it yet. Please use us for this, Father. I ask also that you would bless each one here, Lord, this week as they go about their day and they interact with their families and friends. God, help them, help each of us to humbly carry out these ways before them. I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Real quick, I'm going to just give us a couple of reminders and we'll be dismissed and Josh will give us some awesome walkout music. So uh, one thing, this again, this is our last Sunday outside. Next week we'll be in Legion Hall, and uh, be sure if you don't ha- if you haven't done it yet, make sure we have your email address so we can let you know where we'll be, and uh, get your kids on that uh, memory verse list of the week. And I thank you so much for being here and standing the cold with us. And you are dismissed. <laughs>